Well, good morning. Hey, a few announcements. <clears throat> Starting this Friday, we are having our Thrive Conference, Men's and Women's Conference, with Heather Schott from Mercy Culture in Texas and Pastor Jude Fouquet from the City Church in Ventura, California. That's going to be Friday and Saturday. And then October 30th is going to be our Trunk or Treat that we'll be doing. And then October 9th is the next Seattle Review Service. But check this out. Pastor Russell last night was preaching in D.C., this morning, he's preaching in Texas, and then tomorrow, he'll be preaching on Daystar at 9 a.m., so make sure that you tune in for that. Somebody thought he was sick. He's not. He's doing well. Hey, I want to show you a picture of a church that I used to live in, Alaska, all the way western Alaska by Russia, 40 to 50 below in the winter, millions of mosquitoes in the summer, and I was pastoring at the age of 28, and one day I was just sitting in the church, and I heard the sound of about 10 emergency vehicles come driving by the church, and they stopped at the high school right next door. And it didn't take long for word to get around town that a shooting had happened. And it was one of the first school shootings in the late 90s. And it devastated our community. Two weeks prior, a young boy, Evan Ramsey, he was being bullied at school and he went home angry and he took his backpack off and he threw it against a wall. And the force of that knocked open a door and he saw a Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun. And in that fateful moment, he decided that in two weeks, he was going to end it all. For the next 14 days, two of his friends showed him how to load and shoot the shotgun. Within a week, four to five girls knew about the attack but didn't tell anyone. The morning of the shooting, upwards of 10 people showed up early, climbed the stairs to the commons area, pulled out their cameras, ready to take pictures of the shooting that was about to happen. Evan walks in with a shotgun. He walks into the cafeteria. He shoots a young basketball player, Josh Palacios, and kills him. He shoots two other students, and they survive. A female teacher approached him and said, Evan, give me the gun. And Evan shot her, and she survived. He then walked around the corner just as the principal, an ex-Marine, was coming out of the office. He shot him twice in the chest and killed him. Evan then stuck the shotgun underneath his chin, ready to pull the trigger. He was startled by the police shooting back at him. He threw down the shotgun and yelled out, I don't want to die. Three days later is a 28-year-old lead pastor trying to preach a message to make sense of such tragedy, not knowing what to say or what to do. I just began to preach. But the doors at the back of the auditorium opened, and in walks a man stumbling, crying uncontrollably. He makes his way down to the altar and just lays on the altar. It was the father of the boy that was killed. I didn't know what to do. The only thing I could do was jump off the stage and hug him and cry with him. A week later, I'm doing my very first funeral ever. I don't even know how to do a funeral. <laughs> it's being broadcast across the state of Alaska, government officials. I don't even know what to say. And I remember just looking at the family in the front row, just devastated. And I couldn't even imagine how a father could endure such tragedy. But you know, the Bible says what the enemy meant for harm, that God turns around for good. And that father accepted Christ. And for the past 25 years, he's been serving as a deacon and an elder in the church in Alaska. You see, problems are an inescapable reality in life. 
But another inescapable reality is that God loves you. And he's always wanting to change your situation for good. You know, it's okay to have a problem. It's okay to be going through something. You just can't live there for life. And it reminds me of a story in the Bible that I want to kind of walk you through. It's the story of the three boys who were thrown into a fire. And this story starts with an evil king, as all good stories do. The king's dad was a powerful king who won many wars and created a powerful nation. But when he died, his son became the king and his son did not know how to govern. And it didn't take long before the money was wasted and the people were rebelling and they were saying things like, you haven't done anything like your dad. So this evil king decides to conquer the smaller nations around him to steal their money. So you can say this whole story starts with a guy with daddy issues. And he invades the small nation of Israel. He kills off most of the people. And he takes some of the kids, the talented ones, as slaves and brings them back to Babylon. And this story is about four of those kids. One of them you know. His name is Daniel from the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. And the other three boys you don't know, but you're about to. They were taken back to live as slaves and to do what they were told, but as time goes by, God favors them. In fact, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, that God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had an understanding in all visions and dreams. And then one day, the evil king has a disturbing dream about a giant statue. And all of his sorcerers and magicians and astrologists cannot interpret the dream and the king becomes angry and they justify their lack of interpretation by telling him it's impossible to interpret this dream. But isn't it good that we worship the God of the impossible? So the young slave boy, Daniel, raises his hand and says, I can interpret this dream. And he does. And the king is so happy that he promotes Daniel to being in charge of the whole nation. So Daniel, in turn, takes his three slave friends and makes them his assistants. And now these four boys whose families were killed and taken to a foreign land are now in charge of the whole nation of Babylon. Never underestimate the power of God to change your situation in a moment. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It can change just like that. The king was rich, he was powerful, and he was arrogant. He had already created what I'm going to show you on the screen now as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so he decided, hey, I'm going to build a giant statue, the same statue from the dream. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, it says that the king made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain. And then he sent messages to the high officers and the officials and the governors and advisors and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue. So everyone that was a leader in the nation assembled to dedicate this giant statue. <clears throat> and then a guy comes up on stage and makes an announcement. He says, thanks for coming. But one more thing. When the music starts... Everyone's going to bow down to this statue. And if you don't, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace over here. So the music starts and everyone bows down except for three people over here. And it says in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8, that some of the astrologers, in fact, the same ones who couldn't interpret the dream, it's time for revenge, it says they go to the king and inform on the Jews. Isn't it funny how our life can get really screwed up by other people? <clears throat> the king flies into a rage and forces the three boys to come before him. And he says, is it true that you're refusing to bow down and worship my statue? Now remember, these boys were Jews. And, and Jews had ten big rules. And the second rule was probably the most important. Do not ever worship a created image like a tall golden statue. These boys were also from the tribe of Judah, which means praise and worship. 
Because in the nation of Israel, when the army went out to fight, they sent the worshipers out first. In fact, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that God goes out against our enemies at the beat of our worship. See, in the king's mind, he really just wanted someone to worship him through his statue. But in the spiritual realm, this was an attack of the enemy to steal their worship. Not unlike during COVID. When Governor Inslee sent a letter to all the churches saying, you can gather now, but you can't worship. And maybe in the governor's mind, he was worried that by worshiping, we would be spreading COVID particles, singing blessed assurance. But in the spiritual realm, it was an attack of the enemy to steal the worship of the church. Unfortunately for the governor, he didn't realize that worship is everything to us. It's not a negotiation. And we will never give that up and we will never bow. See, these boys were being pressured to change and adapt to the culture around them. Not unlike today in cancel culture. And the king was really mad because they were going against societal norms because in that part of the world, they worshiped thousands of gods. So for three slave boys to say, not only do we not believe in your false gods, but we worship the one true God was too much for the king to handle. See, the word God can represent any religion, but the name Jesus is dangerous. Because it cancels out all the false gods and points to the one true path to heaven. One day in Ketchikan, Alaska, a Coast Guard captain came to me. He said, we're having a big ceremony down at the dock. Pastor, can you come and say a closing prayer? I said, sure. He said, one restriction. You can say the name God, but you cannot use the name Jesus. I said, okay. And I did my best. I dressed up nice, memorized my prayer. The problem was I grew up in a Pentecostal church where we're used to saying the name Jesus hundreds of times a day. So the ceremony went good, but at the very end, in my mind, I was going to say something like, thank you, God. But what I said was, in Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) And everyone said, amen. (laughs) And the Coast Guard captain was so upset. (laughs) He would have killed me if he could, but I wasn't in the military anymore. So there you go. So the king says, I'll give you one more chance. And if you don't bow down, then I'm going to throw you into the burning furnace, and then we'll see what kind of God's able to save you. And the boys respond in Daniel chapter 3 by saying this. Listen, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But here it is. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Isn't it amazing? They said, God is able to save us. We just don't know if he will. And isn't that the crux of all of our problems? We know God can help us, but will he? We know he can fix my marriage, but is it going to happen? I know my kids need to come home, but is God going to help me do it? Sometimes you just have to say to your problem, yeah, it looks like you got me but I'm never gonna give up. I'm never giving up. See, God doesn't always save us the way we want, but he always saves us according to what is best for us. And so the music plays, and the boys refuse to bow once again, and the angry king has the furnace heated seven times hotter, and the guards tie them up with ropes, and the boys are thrown into the fire, and the fire is so hot that it literally kills the guards instantly. And then something changes. Then something happens. The king threw three in, but now there's four. See, when you're going through the fire, you need a moment in your situation when something changes. Where you literally know something has changed. And in Daniel chapter 3, 
The king says, look, I see four men unbound. Because remember, they were tied up. Walking around the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of God. It was Jesus. See, the fire burned off the ropes that bound them and held them captive. Now listen to this. Did you ever consider that the fire you are in right now might be the very thing that God uses to burn off the chains of addiction and fear that are keeping you captive? See, as Russell says, there's a spiritual purpose to everything we go through. We've been sold a bill of goods as Christians that when you get saved, it's just rainbows and pots of gold and everything's good and you never have issues. But the book of James says to count it joy when you go through something difficult because there's a purpose. Here's the problem. The king didn't expect Jesus to show up in the middle of the fire. The devil who started all this didn't expect Jesus to show up in the middle of the fire. And maybe the problem today is that you don't expect Jesus to show up in the middle of your fire. See, what you need is a revelation in the middle of your story. See, the king saw four men, but when the boys come out, they don't mention the fourth man. They probably didn't even see Jesus. What are you not seeing in your fire today? Where is Jesus in the middle of your storm? What is God saying to you right now that you can't hear because you're so focused on the fire around you? And the king sees the boys are unhurt and not a hair on their head is singed. And their clothes were not burned. And I like this part. Because sometimes you just have to stick around as your situation unfolds and survive and see what God has on the other side of it. Sometimes you just got to stay in the game. After 14 years of living in Alaska, doing funerals, and half of them were suicides by young girls, I came up with a phrase. <clears throat> And it's this, as long as you're still breathing in the morning, you're in the game. As long as you're still alive, you still have a chance to change everything. It doesn't matter how bad it gets, as long as you're breathing, you know that God has birthed you on this planet for a reason and a purpose, you still have a chance to make that happen. But you gotta stay in the game. So how does this story end? Well, the king says to everyone around, remember, this whole story is played out with every official and leader in the nation of Babylon watching. And the king says to them, their God saved them, and now I make a new decree. And remember, this is angry king. He says, if anyone speaks bad against their God, I will tear them limb from limb. And if that's not bad enough, he throws in another threat and says, and I will burn down your house. See, sometimes you just have to reframe your distraction. We get so distracted by the fire that we're going through. And we have to begin to look at it differently. See, every opportunity and every problem is just a chance to turn my focus back to God. But when I'm going through my issues, I can't look up. I look down. Quit framing your life with your problem. Because that is when your problem becomes your filter. Begin to frame your situation with these three things. How is God seeing you? How is God developing you? How is God directing you? And you have to begin to silence the noise of your storm. And remain anchored in the attentive presence of God. Because when I'm going through a storm in my life, I can't sleep. Even though the Bible does say that I can lay down and awake refreshed. The Bible does say I can have dreams and visions in the night season, but when I'm going through something, <clears throat> all I hear is the noise of my situation. Worry, fear, constant conversation that's negative about your issue anchors you in the noise of that problem. 
you have to constantly remind yourself of how good God is and how much He loves you. See, constant reinforcement of negativity changes not only your thoughts, but how you live. And let me tell you a story about that. I grew up in a church that taught that you could lose your salvation at any moment. It was common because we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And if you didn't show up, you were backslidden. Angie, I'm backsliding a lot nowadays. <laughs> and I would hear my uncles give testimony on Wednesdays by saying things like, I'm so glad that I remembered to pray tonight so I don't wake up in hell. I often heard in sermons that if you lived a good life but you died in a car crash and right before you died, you were upset and cursed, you were not going to heaven, you were going to hell. <clears throat> I was taught that, you know, even if you lived a perfect life and you stood before God, and he might even say, Terry, great job. You lived an amazing life. But that one thing. And as a youth and a young adult, that was so reinforced inside of me that it changed the way I lived. And I remember getting out of the military and I had this strange thought occur to me. First, it was like, Terry, you're never getting to heaven. <laughs> a lot of people may make it, but not you, because there's always. And this is my thought. This was my great plan. I'm going to become a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> this is how screwed up your thinking can get. I literally thought, I will become a pastor because I'm never going to make it to heaven, but I will help others get there. That is sad. And I did become a pastor, but it took me 10, 11 years to even begin to believe that God loved me and cared for me. And, and people, God loves you so much. And it's harder to lose your salvation than you think. And God is for you. He's not against you. You have to verbally and mentally reinforce what the Bible says about you every day. That I am the head and not the tail. That I'm an overcomer. That I have peace that surpasses everything. Because you can't let your emotions dictate your choices. See, it's easy in the fast-moving chaos of the storm and the fire around you to emotionally react and make choices that you will later regret. Not unlike when my wife would get on my case. Because if someone texted me or emailed me and was critical of my sermon, I would immediately text back, blah, 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 blah. And she'd say, it never works out for you. <laughs> quit doing that. <laughs> and by and large, I did quit. I mean, every once in a while, I'll, I'll be sitting on my couch, minding my own business, talking with fellow Seahawks fans about how horrible Geno Smith is and will never make the playoffs with Drew Locke on the bench. Why can't they start this guy? And Jenny looks over, and I'm not saying anything, but she can tell by my furrowed eyebrows that I'm not being good. I'm being terrible Terry. And she would, she would say things like, quit. And I'm like, what? You know what you're doing. And then she says, they're going to look at your profile and know you're a pastor at Pursuit. <laughs> so I would apologize. I really do apologize. Um... You know, that was a great conversation. Jenny leaves, but you're still an idiot. <laughs> Click. <clears throat> See, in the hurry of the fire, they slowed down and they took time to pray. The Catholic tradition has an extra chapter where they talk about one of the boys stops in the middle of the fire and begins to pray. And I looked it up and I read the prayer and it was a long prayer. And I was amazed that in the middle of such fury and chaos and fire, that they slowed down to pray. What are you doing in your fire? Are you slowing down to pray? Because complaining and being frustrated and shame and guilt, these are all fuel for the fire that make it bigger. Ignore the speed of your problem and slow down to the pace of God working in your life. Slow down and give God time to work. See, I understood about pace one time 
I was running five miles every night. And then I saw one day a poster on the side of a building or something, and it said, 10K race this Saturday. And I thought to myself, that's a good idea. So I showed up and ate a big bowl of spaghetti 30 minutes before. <laughs> Paid my fee and I went up to the starting line. All of a sudden I knew something was wrong. <laughs> like I, these guys that showed up to race, they didn't look like me. See, I was me wearing basketball shoes and ready to go. These were tall, slender guys and girls with, you know, big legs and running shoes. And they had numbers. And I, I realized later they had flown in from other bases around Europe to run in this official race. And it didn't dawn on me what was about to happen. But when the gun went off and these guys took off running, I, I didn't realize that in running, you're not supposed to run against the other competitors. You're supposed to be running against your own pace. So they took off running and I took off running. And after the first corner, I knew something was wrong. And after a mile, I was done. I stopped and I puked. <laughs> but I didn't quit, Maria. <laughs> I kept running and I finished the race. But I realized that you have to run your race. How many of you are not running God's race in the middle of your storm? You're running at the pace of the enemy. You're running at the pace of the storm and the fire. But we need to slow down. And how do you know that you're running at the wrong pace is when you say things like this in the middle of your storm. Why is God taking so long? Where is God in all of this? Why does this always happen to me? See, God's never early. And God is never late. He's always on time. I want to end with this. One of my favorite shows on TV, it's called Cal Fire. It's about the firefighters in California that every summer they're fighting the big firestorms. And I'm watching this episode, and this big firestorm is coming down the side of a mountain. And the battalion captain says, start the back burn. And I was like, wow, that's dramatic. What is the back burn? And then a guy shows up just like this picture. He's got this canister and he's lighting up all the vegetation and grass and the bushes. And I begin to think, why would you start a fire when there's a big firestorm coming at you? What's the use of this smaller fire? But when you burn up all the vegetation and the big fire gets there, there's nothing left to burn. And the firestorm stops and slows down. See, never underestimate the power of God to use a small fire in your life to burn off things that you don't need. And never underestimate the power of God to use a small fire to help you become the person you need to be in order to handle the big fires when they do come. Maybe, just maybe, you're trying to put out the very fire that God is using to help you. And just like the father of the boy that was killed in the shooting, his life changed forever, but he didn't let it define him. And I'm going to pray in a moment that whatever we're going through today, that it does not define us. That yes, we might be changed for life, but for the better. Please stand as we pray. Come on, Father, we just thank you for every person in this room. Father, we thank you for everyone that is going through a fire and a storm. And we just pray God's favor and grace be released upon you. Come on, and just like that father whose son died, we're praying that God turns it all around. And I say to you today that your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. Come on, I'm going to say it again. Your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. Come on, what the enemy meant for harm, God is turning around for good in your life, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Come on, so we thank you, God, for a release of your favor and grace. Come on, in Jesus' name, everyone said.